Okay, we stopped here at how Islam Mo Baby himself dies and he goes into personal destruction and into destruction will be led. Okay. But that's not the only kind of being one being led into destruction because he all those Muslims now have been ordered by him to go and attack Jerusalem in his last dying words. And you can't find that in English. They'd say it at their little Hajj on the second day at the Hajj when they all cry over Muhammad dying. And it, you'd have to like be on the Hajj in order to know that that's what they rehearse as his last speech. And so it's, it's about six years later. It's really not quite six years. It, they started like 635, 636. But they finally take over Jerusalem. And depending on who you talk to, 636, 637, 638. So they lead Jerusalem to destruction. And what's really interesting about that is there's a, com a conversation between the patriarch, the Byzantine patriarch of Jerusalem, and a guy named Othman the First, who's the guy who does the running, okay, about where was it that David lay down on the threshing floor? That threshing floor was Mount Moriah. That's at the end of Second Samuel. And that's why he bought the threshing floor, and that threshing floor is what ended up becoming the Holy of Holies. And it was a dung heap that the Byzantines perfect, per, perpetually kept as a dung heap. Except that, remember our boy Justinian? You know, he was going to rebuild everything. Well, he built a temple to Mary on top of the dung heap called Neateotakas. You can even find it in Wikipedia. But then, you know, after he did that, then he started warring with the Persians again, and his successor started warring with the Persians again, and it was a dung heap again by the time you get all the way down here. So what was left of the Nea, which was supposed to be a really big temple by the time Justinian finished it, is all in ruins by a hundred years later. Not even a hundred years. So Osman says to the Patriarch of Jerusalem, who is a Byzantine, who didn't want to keep the temple up, said, well, can, well, can I have it? And the Patriarch said, sure, why not? The Holy of Holies was not kept clean. It was not protected. It was not respected because it was Jewish. This is how anti-Semitic they were. The, the very thing that's supposed to depict Messiah, Jesus Christ, who they had claimed to laud, they didn't take care of it. I mean, this is, this is, this just, this is, talk about abomination, of course, that's what abomination means in Daniel 6. Something that's in the Holy of Holies that shouldn't be there. And, of course, the abomination started with, okay, the idea of abomination started way back up here with our boy Diocletian who dies there and with our boy Constantine who dies there. Both are abominating because they're abominating the word of God. Diocletian because he didn't believe in it supposedly. Maybe he's still saved because he believed once in his lifetime. But definitely Constantine was abominating and maybe he's saved too. Okay, but he surely did not mature, because you don't get, you, you, you're, if, if God approves of you, and he's putting you in a timeline like this, he wouldn't put you there, okay? Well, they're not respecting the Holy of Holies either, and so the Muslims take it, and when you turn on your news at night, and you see the Dome of the Rock, that golden dome thingy, really brass I think it's sitting over the very holy of holies so the Muslims are protecting it 
not the Christian. Now they swarmed over in 638. They started building uh, building an earlier version of what would end up becoming the Dome of the Rock. Well, uh, 630, 640s, 650s. They end up taking that down. And from 685 to 689, the structure that you see in your nightly news, that's what they built. And they kept it up after that. Christians didn't want to take care of it, so God hired Muslims to take care of it. See, going to destruction. They wanted the Holy of Holies to go into destruction. So God hired the Muslims to take care of it. And now, of course, the Jews want it back. So it's still an abominated temple because it's got a dome of the rock over it. Okay, so it's still an abomination that everybody can see on nightly TV and disbelieve. Oh, that's just the Bible, it's just fairy stories. Yeah, never mind that it's coming true syllable by ear here. But of course, nobody bothers to learn the scripture and they don't do the syllable counting that any five year old could do. So they don't know how true this is, but are you beginning to see how true this is? Awesome stuff, huh? Okay. So now we come down, and basically all these periods are more and more overruns by the Muslims. Meanwhile, there's still emperors in Byzantium. This particular one, is it, he ends up losing to the Muslims, and he ends up losing the breadbasket of the Byzantium Empire. He ends up losing Egypt, okay, in 616. But he dies at Kai Ta. See another guy dying at a Kai. Kaiser who's relegated to a Kai. And Kai Ta. It's really at the Ta that he dies. So he's not he's not even he's not even a conjunction from having been a Kaiser. He's not even a conjunction, he's just a pronoun. Okay. Now there's like the little musical chairs coming along here. Then comes Constantine the fourth, and you can look him up. And then comes Justinian the second. And when Justinian the second, the son of Constantine the fourth, takes place, he ends up ruling so badly his own people run him out of town in 695 at Altoi Me. See, see, look, Altoi. Mian. And they will be of one mind, is what this says. But the ones who are of one mind, they're of one mind to get rid of Justinian II. <laughs> okay. He's so bad that Constantinople is of one mind to get rid of him. Okay, in the process of doing that, they are of one mind to destroy themselves because there's like seven of them. Do you remember us talking about the ten horns that you saw are ten kings? Well, this is about the development of the ten kings because this ends up being called the 20 years of anarchy. Okay. So, it's like, well, yeah, we're, we're ten horns and we're ten kings and... and we haven't received really any authority yet because we're ten kings. We're all fighting with each other over who should be the one king. Now, Islam has come up and taken over your territory and you're more busy fighting with each other over who's going to be the emperor of a shrinking Byzantium. Why didn't you put your minds together to have one mind instead of ten minds all fighting to see who's going to be top dog? And therefore, nobody having authority, see, of among them kingship, none of them having yet. Yeah, because they're all busy fighting with each other. Meanwhile, you got this new enemy you never heard of at your southern flank. And he's taken over your breadbasket, Egypt, lost in 616. And this was the guy in charge. And as a result of all that, there's a whole lot of blamesmanship and everybody wants to be emperor. Okay, but nobody's trying to say, oh, hey, you know, you got your fights and I got my fights. Why don't the ten of us all get together 
and we're 10 and we fight against other guys. They have, let's fight against the Arabs. And so none of us have any authority right now because let's fight against our common enemy. Oh no, but they give authority to one king for an hour. And that's pretty much how it goes. It's one king and another one and another one and another one. They fight, 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 fight. Comes to a head under Justinian too. Because the only thing they can agree on, all of them with one mind, is we got to get rid of this guy. So then they get rid of this guy and then they resort to fighting with each other again. Okay? And because they resort to fighting with each other again, Justinian the two goes to uh, people who kind of liked him. Okay, at the east and to the Bulgars. And he goes right up the middle. Okay, and at Dumnam and he's back in power again. That's 705. Meanwhile, the Arabs are just eating up all the south. <laughs> okay. He's back in power in 705 and he is so nasty at that point that they murder him in 711. Okay, well 711 is exactly the same year while they're murdering Justinian II. The Muslims are invading Spain. That's how much progress they had made. Now, as a result of all that, that suddenly wakes everybody up. Because, oh, they took our bread basket in Egypt. They took the bread basket that was all of northern Africa. That strip along the coast. Which, you know, had been prosperous for centuries. They took it. The Arabs took it. And now they took Spain, which was their other bread basket. Because they had trade with Spain. Byzantium and Spain. With the Visigoths. And the Muslims took over. In 711. Okay. Right when our boy. Justinian II. Was being killed. So that's five years after this. So we got Kai Exusian. Kai Exusian. And authority. At the word at the end of authority. This word doesn't belong. It's not grammatically, it's not grammatically sound either. Okay. And, see, because he doesn't use it that way. See, Allah Exusian, there's no definite article there. So you don't need it here either. He's making a point about the quality of the authority given. So you don't use that here. Okay. And plus, there's something called Granville Sharp Rule. When you have a definite article modifying a noun, and the other noun is intended to be two sides of a coin, then you don't use the second definite article. That's a Greek grammar rule. And John was really good with Greek grammar. So he, he didn't write the taint. Because power and authority are not separable. Alright, so there's no second article there. Alright. And the uh, power and authority. So you would like hyphenate. And the power hyphen and authority with hyphen, hyphen, in English, to get the idea that power and authority are two sides of the same coin. Okay, at the word, at the end of, of authority, or, yeah, authority, J2 is killed. And the Muslims invade Spain. So that really gets them to thinking, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're going to give all of our power and authority to the beast the political entity that's going to have some kind of concerted religious power in common. Yep. But they're doing it in two separate places. At this point, the Carolingians are in power. It had been the Merovingians, which grew out of Clovis, and it had also been the Visigoths, which just got invaded by the Muslims, so the Visigoths had control of Spain after Rome fell. And then there were the Lombards and some other peoples. But the big point was, is that you had what we now call France and Germany developing as, as it were, tribes that loosely governed themselves according to what were called Mer uh, Clovis and his sons, 
who claim to be descended from some fantastical person called Merove, who in some, some of the stories was actually a sea monster, <laughs> but we'll leave that out. Anyway, the point was is that they had a certain mystique, but they were weak, and that's how the Muslims would say, Muslims were able to take so much, you know, ease and power because that was their territory too, Africa. And so the guys who were running as their so-called first advisors, their prime ministers and all that, they were called mayors of the palace. And they all got together and sort of fight it amongst each other too. And finally one of them emerges. Okay. Finally one of them emerges and he's going to end up being the hero of the story. Meanwhile, in Constantinople you got a new guy. They were suffering the same thing. Constantinople was being besieged by the Arabs within a six year, you know, they tried it earlier, but they started to have some real success in besieging Constantinople in 717. And all of a sudden the guys that were running, Byzantium, see, they're going to give all their power and authority to the beast. They all decide, you know what, maybe we screwed up. And 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 maybe we need to get back to God. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and the guy who sort of champions that idea is a guy named who's going to end up coming to power and ending this cycle of 20 years anarchy. And his name is going to be known to history as Leo III. So in 717, he's the leader of the, the group that drives back the Arabs. So at 7-11, they're invading Spain, but they're being driven back from Constantinople. Not completely, but enough to get breathing space so that Leo III can start to rebuild an army because their treasury was devastated by all this. Okay. So the Arabs are sort of consolidating their power too, and then they start it up again. And this means fighting wars. And they start fighting wars again by the end of this phrase which is 733, which is the Battle of Tours and Poitiers. Now, in my prior videos, I make it sound like Tours and Poitiers are like at the south of France. They're not. They're sort of like in the middle. The Arabs had advanced that far up, but they get pushed back to the Pyrenees at the south of France and, you know, the north of Spain. So they're polemoning. Pole that's it. Po, le, me, susi. Okay. They're making war with the Lamb because as bad as the Christians are, they're the ones who got the Bible. God will do anything to protect His Word. That's the most important lesson to get out of this. You can be the worst Christian in town. And you know what? Justinian pretty much was. But if you got Bible in your vicinity, God's going to protect you. And so it's the Arabs who are making war with the Lamb. Historically in this time zone. Okay. And they're making war with the Lamb, God, Christ. Because as bad as the Christians are, they got Bibles there. And the Arabs would be destroying the Bibles. That's what they did. They go into an area, they destroy the Bibles. All that business about living together in peace with Christians and Jews, that wasn't what they did at first. It was after they got there, and then they did their little destruction thing. Then they settled down, and they end up getting influenced over the next 20, 30 years by the Christians and the Jews having a gentler culture. And that, that ends up becoming such an issue that one of the Arabs who invades Spain um, is an Umayyad. And he's basically the last of the Umayyads. And um, about 200 years after this, the, the Abbasids take over the Umayyads and they hold a banquet for the Umayyads to say, well, we're all going to have peace. And their idea of having peace is to slay every one of them at the banquet. And this one guy of the dynasty escapes. He runs to Spain and he decides, you know what, I don't want to have anything to do with n normal Islam anymore. I'm going to create my own version and I'm going to live in peace with all the Christians and the Jews. And his name was Rachman. And he ends up doing that. And his, his dynasty actually lasts about 200 years. And it was one of the safest places for Jews to go. But he wasn't your typical Arab and he wasn't your typical Muslim. Alright, but that's what happened there. 
So meanwhile, the Arabs are fighting, and they get thrown back at the Battle of Tours. They start to get pushed back, which is about mid-France, mid middle west France, and Poitiers. Meanwhile, Leo III is driving out the Muslims from the Byzantine Empire by 740. And he's launching a back to the Bible movement, which was known, technically speaking, as iconoclasm. In other words, you don't worship those stupid pictures, okay, that are pictures allegedly of Christ. Why not worship his word, which is the actual thoughts of Christ? You want to be near Christ? Here's how to do it. And there was a lot of fighting with the monks over this. A lot of monks agreed with it, and a lot of monks didn't. And it was a sort of mini civil war going on with the prelates. And Leo, unlike Justinian, was not willing to impose his will and interpretation on the prelates. So they got to fight amongst themselves and he tried to arbitrate and he tried to be referee just like Constantine did. But that's still wrong. He shouldn't have been involved in it at all. Okay, but he did drive back the Muslims so Bible was protected. And so that's why I said, you know, they war against the lamb here. It's the Arabs being referenced. And the two saviors, you got Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours in Poitiers in you know, Midwestern France. And then you got Leo III in Byzantium driving him back. And so the Bible's in the western area of Europe, which we had a lot of monasteries had grown up by this point. A lot of them. Very popular, but in Latin. Leo III had all the original manuscripts. In Hebrew and Greek. And actually, they had a lot of original Hebrew manuscripts in Spain. So this was an attack on the Lamb, all right, because it's an attack to get rid of his word. And so God deployed Charles Martel in the West and Leo III in the East to drive back the Muslims by 740. Otherwise, this Bible text that you're looking at, you wouldn't have. Is that dramatic? Okay, well, so then there's another rest period, and I'm sure there's something important to say about this period, but I don't know what it is. You know, the, it's pretty important that the Lamb will conquer them. Well, yeah, he did. See, this is 743, and by 740, they were conquered there. They were driven back, they were driven back into Spain by 743 from the west. And then we come up with the most hysterical verse in the New Testament. So I think I'll wait for that in the next increment.